So it's sort of difficult for me to determine what the purpose of this video is. You know, maybe I'm just trying to share information here. For any of you that are interested in going down some of these rabbit holes with philosophy, uh, theology, religion, learning about the roots of it all, and trying to make sense of it all, right? Trying to see where the, uh, the science is and a lot of this stuff, why people were so obsessed with some of these ideologies, right? For any of you guys that are curious with this stuff, this video could really be quite fascinating. I've kind of been curious about this stuff for a long time, over 10 years, and it's stuff that you just don't bring up in a conversation, right? All of us know what it's like to have something to explain to somebody and just not enough time to explain it without sounding like a crazy person. Um, so to, to keep this intro short, you know, I, I hope some of you guys have the, the patience uh, and just the interest to watch the majority of this video. You know, it, it, towards the beginning here, the first maybe even 20 minutes or so, I'm going over things that seem pretty basic, you know, they, they seem like stuff that you probably heard before. Uh, but after that, I, I promise you, the climax is later in this video. But it's important to get these first bits out first. I have to explain the basics, if you will, to describe where I'm going with all of this. So, for those that have the patience to listen to it, uh, I think you're really going to enjoy it, especially when we start talking about the stars and I start kind of teaching you guys the night sky. Um, it's pretty neat stuff. And I guess the only disclaimer I have is that this video is not trying to change your perception or change your beliefs on anything uh, having to do with religion, theology, philosophy. Again, I'm just simply sharing information. Now, if this information does change your perspective on some of that stuff, then so be it. Uh, but again, you know, don't, don't get mad at me because this is definitely some stuff that makes you question uh, what you've been taught. This can put a lot of things into question, although it answers many, many questions. And I believe that it'll clarify a lot of this stuff for you guys. It'll clarify the roots of religion, theology, and philosophy all into one nice little package. Uh, and you'll never look at this artwork the same. It'll jump right out at you. So let's get started. Now, to begin with all this information, we're going to start with one of these really old atlases, right? These really old maps of the Earth. Uh, I believe this one's from the 15 or 1600s. Uh, this one's pretty rare and, and super old, which makes it that much more juicy for this information that I'm about to share with you. So, <clears throat> on this map, I think we're pretty familiar with uh, what some of these lines represent. So the main bold line that's running straight across horizontally is, is obviously the equator of the Earth, right? You have above that, slightly more faint, uh, written above it, you have the Tropic of Cancer, right? And below that, you've got the Tropic of Capricorn. Now, you have in the middle this sine wave, okay? The sideways S looking line. That's actually the path that the sun takes throughout the year. Uh, the path of the direct sunlight on the face of the earth as we change our seasons. Now also, which makes this even more interesting, is that a lot of these little pictures, the artwork around the map, uh, these appear to be constellations. So one that really stands out, it's pretty obvious, is Aquarius. This person with this pot of water here, dumping it out, right? And I know that's Aquarius because to the right of that you have what looks like a giant whale, okay? That whale is Cetus, or the sea monster, uh, another constellation. Right here lined up in the middle, when the sun crosses the equator at September 21st, okay, that's the fall equinox. Just below that, as the sun enters Libra, you have Libra. You have Lady Justice. She's got the sword, the book in the other hand. Okay. Down here to the bottom right, you've got a lion laying down. Next to him you have a bull, right? That's Leo. Uh, the bull represents Taurus. You've got the lamb or ram of Aries as well. Coming up here to the north, you've got Aquila or the eagle. You've got, you've got what looks like a fire-breathing dragon. I believe that's meant to be Draco, the uh, dragon constellation that, that circles the North Pole. Naturally, he would be up at the top of this picture. 
along with the chariot, right? The charioteer. So, in this big map, you've got clear attention to the path of the sun. You've even got that sun picture right in the middle. And then you've got the constellations surrounding the earth all the way back in the 15 and 1600s. So here's an easier way to look at that sine wave pattern, right? When we hit the spring equinox at March 21st, we say that the sun rises in Aries, okay? Then, as we progress throughout the year, when we go through Aries, Taurus, and Gemini, our three spring months, the sun rises then, at June 21st, at the furthest north point compared to the equator. We call that the Tropic of Cancer, right? As the sun enters Cancer, it appears to go sideways for about three days, and then it begins its trek back down towards the equator uh, during the three months that we call summer, right? Through Cancer, Leo, and Virgo. By the time we get to September 21st, the point back at the autumn equinox, right in the center here, the sun appears to line up in front of the constellation of the scales, or Libra. September 21st, lining up in Libra, this represents the fall months, okay? So we have Libra, Scorpio, and Sagittarius as the rulers of the fall months. This is when the days start getting shorter than the nights in the year. So down here at December 21st, the sun lines up, rises at our winter solstice, enters the sign of Capricorn, the goat that's always moving uphill, uh, just as it begins its trek back up towards the equator. Uh, by December 24th, December 25th, we actually celebrate the return of that light, or the, the return of the sun coming back up towards the equator. Now, knowing that the solar year starts at March 21st, if we count March as the first month, and we come all the way over to Libra, when we get to September, okay, the seventh sign, this is why Sept in September means seven, Oct in October means eight, Nov in November means nine, Deci in December is ten, right? March is the first month of the solar year. And from our perspective, this is sort of what it looks like throughout the year, as long as you're in the northern hemisphere, okay? So March 21st and September 21st, the sun lines up directly east when it rises and sets directly in the west, no matter where you are on Earth. Now, if this person is standing at the equator on the December solstice, okay, down at December 21st, the sun's going to appear to rise about 23 and a half degrees south of east, and it's going to set at that same degree south of west. Inversely, at the summer solstice, the longer days throughout the year, where there are more hours of sunlight, the sun's going to rise slightly north of east. At the equator, it'll be about 23 and a half degrees. The further away you get from the equator, the wider these three points are going to separate from one another. So if you go to places that are pretty far north or south of the equator, the sunrise at the solstices is going to be pretty dramatic. It's going to look like the sun's almost rising completely in the north or so close to the south that it just it kind of throws you off. It's kind of bizarre to think that the days are much longer uh, the further you get away from the equator, but that's the way it works out. And here's just another depiction of that, right? Your December rays are coming from the south. Your June rays are coming from the north. And we'll use this diagram uh, to show what the backdrop of the sun looks like throughout the year, right? As we rotate around the sun, there's a constellation that gets blocked out by the sun, but we can know that it's back there uh, because of how we can relate it to the night sky when the sun sets. So when one says the sun is in Leo, what they mean is Leo is the constellation that's at the backdrop of the sun. This is a way that we like to measure our seasons. This is a way that we like to know what time of year it is, uh, especially before we had our calendars and smart devices that we have now. Now, to get an idea about how important these movements were to our ancient civilizations, we can understand that the word temple 
has the Greek word root temp in it, uh, or out of tempus, or if you think of temporary or tempo, temp means time, okay? So the word temple refers to time. Now, how is it that a temple measures time? Well, it, it, it measures the movement of the sun, okay? So the first example here, uh, this is at Stonehenge, and a lot of these people line up to see this. This is at the spring or fall equinox. The sun rises right in the middle, right? Then we get all the way up to summer. And then, of course, down at winter solstice, you can see everybody's got all their jackets on. The sun rises to the furthest left of these three points. Now, Stonehenge isn't the only place that does this. This one's pretty fun. This is in Mexico. Pretty popular pyramid. Okay, same thing. You have this rather large group of people. You can't tell with this picture, but this is a very popular thing to do when you're down there. Um, when the sun rises, it uses the edge of this pyramid to cast a shadow that makes it appear like this big serpent is coming from the heavens, if you will, and coming to the earth. Okay, this was often a, a symbol for fall, right? That great, terrible serpent would bring bad weather. It would bring more darkness than light, right? This is that serpent. We're going to talk more about that serpent later on. This is Angkor Wat. That's in the far east, right? Completely different civilization. However, they pay attention to this solar movement as well. And they have these really elaborate structures that are going to mark out these movements, right? You've got your solstice points to the left and to the right as well. This structure here is in India. Same thing. And to many people's surprise, Egypt actually does this. So we know we have three pyramids in Egypt, right? The one that lines up right in the middle with the Sphinx. The sun's going to rise right behind that pyramid for the spring and fall equinox. And throughout the year, this is what the sunrise looks like. Okay? The size of the pyramids indicate the seasons. So as the sun begins to rise all the way over to the right, and starts rising in line with the pyramid on the right that marks our summer solstice. As the sun rises to the furthest pyramid to the left, the smaller one that's going to represent a weaker sun or the winter solstice. So now as we go to Rome, this is when this stuff gets really interesting. This is St. Peter's Basilica. The most popular site here is the altar. As you can see, it's got the sun disc, right? It's got the 12 divisions in it. This is St. Peter's chair. We'll tell his story here in a little bit. And when the Pope walks out, he carries this big sun disc, again with the 12 divisions in it. Out front of the basilica, you have this Egyptian obelisk it actually acts as a sundial. Okay, you have the time indicator on these inner circles. And as you move out, you have your, your seasons. Now the tip of that obelisk's shadow moves around and hits these glyphs that are in the ground and the cobblestone there. Now this is the solstice point where Gemini meets Cancer. Over here, you'll see that it's got the two days that correlate with the same shadow. So, for example, we've got the 19th of February in Pisces, and inversely, we have uh, the 23rd of Scorpio. Now, aside from the temples that are around the world that follow the sun, you have these images, and some of them are very old. This is of the Buddha, also representing the sun disk. Another one here. People are usually surprised to see the swastika on the chest of Buddha. Uh, a little history on that. The swastika is the symbol for the sun god Surya. Notice to the Hindus as well. So here's Krishna. Notice the seven horses in front. 
This is the Persian Ahura Mazda. He's the sun god in, in Zoroastrianism. Uh, the first day of that Zoroastrian calendar is March 21st, right? Uh, this is also where the car company Mazda uh, derives its name from. Now remember, Mazda and Chrysler are, are pretty, pretty close, right? And not to forget, Amun-Ra, Egyptian sun god, he carries this iron scepter, right? Now, Ra has different names, depending on which sun we're referring to, right? When we get down to Amun-Ra, this yellow sun, this also refers to the winter solstice sun, okay? So Amun-Ra, okay, is the sun at the winter solstice to the Egyptians. And here we can see the largest temple in the world. This is the temple of Karnak in Egypt. Notice all of these sphinxes here on each side. They actually have heads of rams on them. Okay. At the winter solstice, the sun's going to rise right down the middle of this corridor over the altar at the end. And people line up to see this. Okay, this is the death place and also the birthplace of the sun or the sun god Ra, Amun-Ra. Now, in Revelation, Jesus calls himself the Amun, right? In Hebrew, sure, they say that the word Amen means I agree. But here, you know, a lot of this stuff comes straight out of Egypt. How did Egypt get to Rome? Well, if we, a <laughs> little history lesson on uh, Cleopatra and Caesar, you can look into that, and that should uh, explain a lot, a lot of how this culture made its way over to Rome. So what is it with these religious structures, their attention to the sun, right? As well as these religious figures, their attention to the sun. You have all these monuments throughout the world, or these temples, right, that follow the sun. You see zodiac signs on the floors of cathedrals. Here we have Sun disc Jesus in the middle with the zodiac wheel around him, the floor of a synagogue. It's very old, so old that the study goes back to ancient Egypt. So let's explore these connections a little bit further. And rather than looking at the connections to the world with the sun, we're actually going to look at uh, some stories that talk about the night sky itself. This is where all this stuff gets really, really interesting. Um, this is where a lot of this stuff may come to a shock or surprise. But I assure you this is going to be worth paying attention to. And you guys are going to have a lot more information. This is going to clarify and clear up a lot of questions for you. So this is an app called Star Tracker. Uh, it's a celestial viewing app. It uses the gyroscope in your device, your phone or tablet or whatever. Um, as you move it around and you look at the night sky, it's going to tell you what you're looking at. Um, I can also just kind of manually move this thing around. Uh, sometimes it gets a little glitchy depending on internet connection and stuff like that. Uh, but it's a great app. It's a lot of fun and I use it an awful lot now. Um, so to explain this next little story, um, we're going to start here at Polaris. This green line is my horizon, right? So I'm looking north. And if I turn 90 degrees to my right, now I'm looking to the east, okay? Uh, it's in the evening right now, but right now I have this set to show the morning to, uh, to explain the story that I'm about to share with you guys. If I keep turning 90 degrees again, I look at the southern sky here, right? And 90 degrees again. This is the west. This dotted line here is the ecliptic. That's the path that the sun and the planets follow throughout the year. They don't deviate much away from that dotted line. So here we have constellations that rise in the east. They then come straight up this way. And from this point, straight up at the meridian on, these constellations are going to be appearing to set and go down under the western horizon there. The first story that I'm going to share with you guys is actually out of the book of Revelation.
So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to read some of these verses uh, out of Revelation and a few other stories out of the Bible. Now, one thing to keep in mind is, is please don't think that I'm trying to preach to anybody. Uh, I'm not lecturing anybody. I'm just simply relating these verses to what I've been learning about the night sky, literally. So even if you guys are not familiar with the Bible or if you never cared to read it, uh, just look at this like it's entertainment. So Revelation 12 and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailed in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Now in Revelation we have this sign in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon was at her feet around a new moon in the fall or late summer this sign appears in heaven okay she was about to give birth to a man that was going to rule with an iron scepter that's the iron scepter of the sun or she gives the birth to the sun itself now she's going to give birth but there's the serpent at her feet right revelation says I saw another sign in heaven, and it was a great dragon, Draco, dragon, who had the power in his tail to sweep away a third of the stars in heaven. Draco governs a third of that celestial sphere, right? He's circumpolar. He's going to go around Polaris, never setting. Who can defeat him, right? Now that dragon cast down you have Hercules here. Remember, Hercules in the 12 tasks is the sun through these 12 zodiac signs. More on that later. But correlating with Hercules fighting the Hydra, the multi-headed beast, he cuts off one head and they grow back, right? The fatal wound now healed. Hey, Phil. That, that wasn't so hard. Kid, kid, kid. How many horns do you see? Six. Eh, close enough. Let's get you cleaned up. That doesn't sound good. <laughs> Definitely not good. <laughs> this dragon cast down to the earth that great serpent of old the multi-headed beasts many heads horns on its heads and the seven crowns or the seven diadems and the crown on the serpent's head okay this is a seven starred constellation called corona borealis it's the crown and there was a war in heaven michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought against his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now as for the reference to Michael and his angels defeating the dragon, right? Casting the dragon down to the earth. Way back from the 12th century forward, so before the year 1200 to now, there's this festival that's still celebrated among certain Christian communities called Michaelmas Day. Now, Michaelmas Day is celebrated during this time of year, September 29th, when the sun is in the vicinity of Virgo. And if we look at some of this really old artwork, again, this is 12th century artwork, we have this attention to what we see in the stars. So you've got the wings of Virgo. Notice the sun disk behind Michael's head. He's even holding what looks like the sun, okay, signifying the woman clothed with the sun even. Below that, you've got the scales of Libra. And then with this big 
staff here, you can see it's stabbing the dragon down at the bottom. Now another way to show how this makes sense, remember this green line is my horizon, right? When the sun rises, the stars disappear, okay? So when the sun is in Virgo, the dragon is going to disappear from the sky at sunrise. The dragon's defeated, so to speak. And he's only defeated for a short time because as the sun moves through these other signs, he's going to show up again in the evening. And when we get down to 12, 13 here, and when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man-child. And the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she may fly into the wilderness into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and a half time from the face of the serpent. Now there's another serpent here. Virgo is surrounded by snakes. Okay. To the south we have Hydra. Hydra is always underneath this woman. The woman is given wings. Right. This is flying straight up into the sky, following this dotted line, until she eventually sets over here in the west. Now over here in the west, we have these waters. This is the River Iridanus. This is Cetus, the sea whale. We've got the two fish of Pisces. You've also got Aquarius down here, the water bear. Okay, this is, this is water world to the west. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. So... Revelation says this serpent casts out a flood to try and catch the woman, right? But the earth, as all of this sets, the earth is going to swallow the flood, right? Now, quick tangent, more on this being water world. Over here all setting at the same time you have this these other characters you've got cephas cassiopeia and andromeda okay in greek mythology poseidon gets upset with cephas for claiming to be more beautiful than one of his nymphs uh or he claimed that cassiopeia was so poseidon sends cetus this big sea whale or the monster out of the sea, right? To the shores of Cephas's kingdom. Cephas and Cassiopeia consult an oracle. They say, how do we get rid of this whale? They say, you need to sacrifice your daughter, Andromeda. And Poseidon chains her to a rock to be with the sea whale. Now, if you Google the rock constellation, Andromeda is going to pop up because of this, because of that story. So... In the Bible, Jesus calls Peter Cephas. Okay, Cephas and Andrew is like saying Cephas and Andromeda. Now, if that's still vague, if that's not clear enough, remember Peter, or Cephas, and Andrew were both the sons of Jonah. Jonah spends three days in the belly of a whale. Okay, they were fishermen, right? Jesus says, come with me and I'll teach you how to be fishers of men. The three days in the belly of the whale. Naturally, Peter, or Cephas, denies Jesus three times. Okay, you have this three-day scenario. Now remember, that was a quick tangent. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that these were the waters to the west. And as we come up into the midheaven and back down to the east we have this woman who's headed to the waters now you understand the woman right uh, going into the heavens the serpent casting out the flood right the waters swallowed up by the earth now there are more signs uh, that we read in revelation now after the sun passes through this sign it's going to start rising in front of the scales the scales of libra we see uh, Lady Justice holding on every courthouse, right? The, the Justice Department is represented by the scales of Libra. 
If I stay perpendicular to this dotted line, the ecliptic, we have these constellations that are called deacons, or they go alongside the signs of the zodiac. Okay? Deacons of Libra. To the north, we have Corona Borealis, or the crown. This was literally depicted as a crown of thorns uh, back in the artwork of the 14 through 1600s. And to the south, we have the constellation of Crux, or the cross. So as the sun rises in front of the scales of justice, it is judged. Okay? It gains its crown and its cross, and the days start becoming shorter than the nights. Revelation goes on, it talks about a beast with the power in its tail that torment men for five months. This is Scorpio, right? Now, Scorpio is one, Sagittarius is two, Capricorn is three, Aquarius is four, Pisces is five. Okay, there's your five months of torment, and then we're saved by the Lamb, or the Ram of Aries, the spring. When day and night are in balance again, and the sun passes over the equator in the springtime, the Jews celebrate this, they even call it Passover, right? Or Christians uh, celebrate Easter. Okay, we, we say, He is risen. Easter is always right after the first full moon of the equinox. It's the Sunday following that full moon. Now, the lamb, okay, Moses, as Michelangelo depicted him with horns on his head in his artwork, and we've seen this throughout the world, Moses blows the ram's horn, right? And the Jews even do this. They even eat lamb around this festival. Moses is representative of Aries. Now, Aries parts the waters. Okay? I just showed you guys how these are the waters. Aries has his foot on the head of that beast out of the sea. We're saved by the Lamb, the blood of the Lamb, as we begin a new solar season. Now, there are four riders, right, in Revelation, or the horsemen. They're all carrying things. One has the scales. One has a sword. In the oldest cuneiform writings, this Scorpio constellation used to be the double sword constellation. If that throws you off, the next rider has a bow and a crown. Okay. And the fourth is death itself. Now, down here in Capricorn, that is the point of the death of the sun. That's the lowest point, right? When the sun is the weakest throughout the year. These four horsemen control a quarter of the earth, right? Four out of twelve. Then you have your baptism, if you will. These water signs and the lamp. Okay, before Scorpio was the scorpion, it was the eagle. The eagle is one of the four living creatures, right? The eagle, the lion, the bull, and the man. The four living creatures, or the four beasts, represent the four signs that are in the middle or at the climax of each of the four seasons. They mark the seasons. Now that's Revelation, uh, but I've got one more story for you. Now, as the sun starts rising in front of the man that's bearing water, if you head out after sunset, you can watch this play play out in the southern sky where this big boat starts to rise and eventually set right this big boat is called argo a-r-g-o and we're going to bring them up a little more if i stay in front of this boat we've got canis major canis minor two dogs staying on top of the boat just looking up 
northward now. Now I'm looking straight up. I've got Leo and Leo Minor. Further to the north, I've got Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. Okay, I've got two bears, two lions, two dogs. Okay, I've even got two people, the twins. But there's, there's these animals on this boat called Argo that covers a massive portion of the southern sky. Animals two by two by two. Okay, thinking of Noah's Ark. Now, if that doesn't do it for you, remember Noah sends out a crow, Corvus, or raven. Uh, bird doesn't come back. Noah says, well, I guess the waters haven't receded. And yet, seven days later, he sends out a dove. And the dove brings back an olive branch. That's Columba. Right? Noah even has a drink. Okay, as this play keeps going. Noah gets drunk. This is crater. This is what the Greeks uh, would serve wine out of. Okay, this is also the woman that holds the cup. Uh, cup of wrath, cup of salvation. Okay, now for the many references that the Bible speaks about in regard to wine. Okay, Virgo is not only the harvest season where she holds the stalk of grain. She also represents wine season. Okay. One of the stars in Virgo is named Vindemiatrix, uh, referring to the vine, the grape vine. Okay, Vindemiatrix was, was the symbol of the harvest of the grapes. And there are some old artwork. Uh, the pieces are called Jesus and the Wine Press. And they were drawn and, and painted way back during the same years that the Bible was created, right? So 1400s or so. And you see all this artwork that just looks kind of odd, but you see Jesus essentially in this proverbial wine press. And you see his blood being drained into a cup below. So to show you what this is referring to is as the sun lines up in this sign in the heavens, right? The sign of, of the pressing of the wine into the crater. If you watch how the sun rises, it's going to drain into this cup throughout the day, okay? As it then sets below the horizon. That pressing of the sun's vital life force, right? Or the drinking of the blood at the Last Supper, the communion right after that we begin judgment and the nights become longer than the days now while we're talking about all this many of you can recognize this painting this is uh leonardo da vinci's the last supper and da vinci knew all this stuff okay a lot of the artists did back then putting these themes in their artwork so if you see here we have jesus right in the middle and right away you can kind of see the three windows in the background a lot like what I showed you guys with Stonehenge. Now to Jesus' left, you have this man spreading his arms out. Okay, that signifies the scales. He's representing Libra here. And naturally, right before that fall, on the left you have your spring and summer months, each grouped into threes, right, for each season. Those of you might recognize uh, the third person from the left. Gemini rules the hands, and the guy has his hands up. Um, but the only woman in the picture is Virgo, or the Virgin Mary. Okay, at the Last Supper, before judgment, right? Before Jesus, or the sun, crosses over the equator, he's going to be leaving the vicinity of the Virgin. Okay, if Leonardo da Vinci knew this, and Michelangelo knew it, and they showed it in their artwork, that shows you how prevalent this information was way back in these years there's the betrayal through scorpio and sagittarius capricorn where the sun's at its death then we have this baptism moment if you will this is also john the baptist but we'll get into some of those stories in another video okay how about two fish and a loaf of bread
Okay, we're, we're in the age of Pisces right now. So meaning when you look up at March 21st, the constellation that's going to be the backdrop of the sun is actually Pisces because of this procession. Uh, procession is a whole nother video. And I'm going to try and stay on topic here. As Jesus fed the masses with two fish and a loaf of bread, that's a very, very clear representation of this axis. Okay, Pisces referring to the two fish, is straight across the zodiac from Virgo, right? Remember, she's not just the wine, she's also the harvest, the harvest of the wheat. To further explain this, there's an asterism. An asterism is like a slang term for a smaller piece of a constellation. Uh, astronomers and stargazers use these asterisms just to kind of better navigate themselves around. So there's an asterism in the constellation of Leo, and it's called the sickle. The sickle just really makes up the Leo's mane and face down to Regulus, the heart, right? Now, if we put the sun in this time of year, as it approaches the sickle, you could say that the sun is holding the sickle. The sun literally holds the sickle this time of year as it sets, telling the farmers that it's time to harvest. Okay, if not there, then definitely through Virgo. First the wheat, then the wine. This is the true meaning of on earth as it is in heaven.